We are creatures of incredible potential to create and think and make things. All this stuff that humans can do and to have you know, the large impact on the world that they can have, to do it in fascinating, inventive ways that no one's ever really dreamed of, you know, that's art. But still, to be able to take all of that and put it in you know, one succinct project, you know, what a glorious goal to strive to, although perhaps ultimately a futile one still. Uh, you know, what's, the, what's the harm in trying? I'm so damn avant-garde. Well, uh, Hogarth was a, a very interesting character. He was a peculiar fellow. Quite serious, I think. Quite bright, um, but almost totally incomprehensible. I, I remember uh, distinctly uh, an assignment I gave in class one day. Uh, the students had to do a very simple playwriting exercise and uh, create a short dialogue between two characters where one character wants something from the other character. So you've got objective, objective, conflict, boom. Well, Hogarth wrote the most incomprehensible thing I'd ever seen. Showed up later in one of his films. I just feel that you don't give me the proper cooling temperature. It's always too hot or slightly chilly, and I try to adjust your settings, but I just can't do it. Why can't there be an intermediate between level three and level four on your speed setting? Why? I just feel that you don't really understand me. He always delighted in Whatever it was he did. Hogarth is a very demanding director. But he has so much respect for the actors. I mean, the true emotion that I had to portray in, in the scene with the fan and the realistic compositor, I mean, I still, I still have bad memories involving fans. When I first laid eyes on Hogarth, I thought, you know, here is someone quite bright, a real smart kid. Maybe. Actually, I didn't really know. He never said a single thing to me that made any sense. I don't think so. Oh, wait. Once I heard him say he was hungry. Now, that was pretty logical. Hogarth Dieteray. The name evokes a swell of emotions from those in the know. Some consider him a genius, and others call him schizophrenic. But the fact is, Hogarth is all of these things and none of these things. Hogarth took the film world by storm with his early efforts. At the age of only 16, he managed to direct his first short film, a shortened version of Othello, with the title role going to a dog picked up at the local pound. That I did love the more my downright violence and storm of fortune may trumpet to the world. My very heart is subdued by the quality of my lord. This marked a distinguished director's first work with noted thespian Janice Brockovich. Working on Othello was such a wonderful experience. I mean, Hogarth, he helped me. To understand my co-star, I mean, that dog is a natural actor. You know, what, what may be there may really not be there, and vice versa. You, you have this situation where you have all this stuff compressed in this small box, you know, very easy to digest and very easily presented to the American public who just lap it all up. Uh, this is what I thought I was really able to convey in Othello and uh, what Shakespeare really intended. It was while Othello was making the festival circuits that Hogarth met the artist known only as Bohemian Number no. One. He was so avant-garde that he refused to acknowledge the existence of color and lived only in black and white. I honestly was not impressed by Hogarth's Othello at all when I saw him. I thought it, it seemed Hollywood, it seemed like he was just trying to convey the feeling of Othello to the masses, and 
in his dribble. Having a student in my class with a film already on the festival circuit could be a bit stressful for the other students. I mean, obviously, they'd all heard of his Othello, and most of them had seen it. It was also a tad strange for him, I suppose, to come marching to class with his awards and newfound fame. But not for Bohemian number one, though. No. He despised Hogarth and his film. He thought it was the stupidest thing he had ever seen. <laughs> they immediately became best friends. Hogarth and Bohemian Number 1 made a total of 23 films from lengths varying from 2 to 97 minutes. The lengths of each of their films was a prime number, even to the second. The prime numbers were not a conscious effort on our part. They just sort of happened. Highlights from this period include license for an unmaintainable element, respond to giant apostrophes, mellow wrongdoings really tick off Spudniks, and their masterpiece, Why Reclaim Your Clams When They Show Signs of Disastrous Derision. The snow is coming. Yes, we must reclaim our clams. Why reclaim your clams when they show signs of disastrous derision? You have a point. Yes. Yes, I do. <coughs> Please calm yourself. It's only a monster. Yes. You are right. I am sorry. I overreacted. To tell you the truth, uh, I don't think we knew anything what we were doing, or for that matter, saying. Oh man, I was, uh, I was drunk during the whole filming of the thing. Next thing I know, I'm walking down a red carpet and <laughs> surrounded by a bunch of artsy people saying that Hogarth is like the next Orson Welles and. And I tell you the truth, I don't even think Bo or Hogarth knew what the hell they were doing. That film was the last time I really saw Bo and Hogarth truly happy. They melded on that film. And then the problems began. The incident to which Janice is speaking occurred during the filming of what was to be the pair's next film, Mom Makes Sense Only When Speaking Without an Armchair. One day, Hogarth just erupted. The entire incident was captured on video. We can't have it buried in the teacups. It's not experimental enough. It's not avant-garde. Listen, Hogarth, you think you're experimental? You think you're avant-garde? I'm a million times more avant-garde than you. <laughs> Look, I, I know avant-garde! I listen to music that comes on a distribution of 100 or less. What do you listen to? I listen to music that's so avant-garde it doesn't even exist! Man. Bo wasn't very avant-garde, and I only associate with those who are. Simply, the, the charisma... Uh, was over-evaluated to such an extent that uh, the gel simply didn't collide in a congenial or friendly way. Hogarth and Bo parted for their separate ways, and Hogarth began the film that he would eventually be known for. Unfortunately, it was also to be the last film he would ever make. When you think a problem this may be, even now, lead thing be coming ever closer. Oh, twere I not under this big pencil. But me has an idea. I will repel it with big head. Please, please don't throw me at the pencil. Quiet, you. I created you, and to your maker you must go. One of my most challenging, though. I mean, it hit them all. Toronto, Sundance, Cannes. We were whining and dining with the bigwigs. Hogarth was on the rise. Finally separated from Bohemian Number 1, he was truly gaining respect as an artist in his own right. And then the great videotape shortage began. Plain and simple. 
due to a gross miscalculation about the availability of videotape and a huge rise in filmmaking due to the video revolution, everybody suddenly woke up one morning to find that the great supply of videotape we'd always taken for granted was no longer available. So, videotape was only given to those who needed it most. Who would have guessed that the world was running out of videotape? Yet it was. And the estimate was that if it was consumed at the current rate, we would be out of videotape in one year. Manufacturers simply could not keep up with that demand. And filmmakers had to apply for tape on a case-by-case -case basis. They rejected Hogarth. They said his work was incomprehensible and pointless. That really hurt him, I think. In the end, it came down to what the public wanted. And while some people saw Hogarth for what he was, a genius, it was ultimately determined that given the limited amount of videotape, it would be better put to use in making adult features. Hogarth drifted into a period of depression, one from which he was unable to rise from his bed and go about even his daily activities. Caught in a whirlpool of chocolate addiction, Hogarth seemed due to hit the deep end any day. I tried to console him. I told him that people were still watching and discussing his films, that his impact was still being felt. Of course, I neglected to tell him that the overwhelming majority now thought that he was a pretentious idiot who obviously had no idea what he was doing. I'm consoled that people watch my movies, but... Uh, I'm beyond that inferior academic sort of satisfaction now. I'm working on the new art, the mental art of mentality. Hogarth, finally out of his weeks of depression, has started to rise out of the depths and into the world again. Finding strength once more, he has developed a new theory of art. His new art form, which he calls the mental art of mentality involves mentally transmitting mental images from the mind of one to the other, the whole process taking place mentally. Between here and my head are things now to you being sent, and these things can really come together and form a whole product of conscious elements derived from their respective facets for something extraordinary to take place. With his new art form, Hogarth is clearly moving into the future. The video shortage is over and he could easily go back to making movies, but he has moved on. Yet, his past will never be forgotten. Well, I think the world has definitely felt the pull of Hogarth. Well, he was one of the most creative experimental filmmakers in the world. His stuff was so hard to digest, I don't think anybody could. But he was either light years ahead of his time or completely insane. Probably the latter. I will always remember the films I made with Hogarth. Always. And that's a feat because we made quite a lot of them. My genius? Uh, that's a question best worked out by innumerable persons on the level of higher education, uh, developing their own theories concerning the duplicity of man and the themes of which he can proliferate and ensure his own survival. Um, to go further, uh, the ways that one can find this effort to be not in vain would be by evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of all concerned and reach a conclusion that unravels the mystery of what was once conversely its opposite. Am I making myself clear?